Hello, this is uh, Mister Fusion, and this is your. your oh, oh, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is unscripted, people. Yeah, um, it's Evil Professor checking in. You know, it's not actually unscripted. We each have our separate scripts that we're trying to force the other person into, right? <laughs> well, that's right. With my mind don't powers. Tell them, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> You're blowing my cover. Okay, so um, this last weekend, uh, all three of us went to see uh, the new Green Hornet movie. Um, not, like, together, of course. Um, that would be weird. Yeah, I like, traveled yeah, I across the country to see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think my wife would appreciate it either. <laughs> um, so, uh, don't really know how to start this. Does anybody have any initial thoughts they want to get out? Well, for first, I want to say it should be noted that ne none of us have talked to each other about how we feel about this movie. Oh, true that. Before this moment, this is all we're all completely cold to each other's opinions going into this. That is very true. Um, I think. I can safely say that we don't know a whole lot about Green Hornet either. At least I know I don't. Uh, yeah, just a little bit. So it's really fresh for me. How about you, Mr. Crowley? Did you know anything about Green uh, Hornet at all? No, or do you know? I, I used to watch the TV show when I was younger. Um, but I can barely remember anything about that except for uh, um, the, that the car was awesome. And I remember that theme song. That theme song's been stuck in my head since I was a little kid. The, like the bzzz, But, um... <laughs> yeah, other than that, nothing. <laughs> well, that that makes you our official expert today. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes you uh, the seasoned veteran here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're kind of lost then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I admit I did I did do some research on on the character in the series after I saw the movie. I didn't I, I went into the movie completely cold, but I I did some research on it afterwards just to see you know j just to make sure I wasn't going to say anything completely stupid when I when I got I, out here. <laughs> I have no problem saying anything completely stupid. That's fine. <laughs> you're, a, you're a braver man than I. <laughs> ah, it's fun. Um, so I guess initial thoughts for the movie. Um, geez, before before I go really into detail, I was not terribly impressed. I think I'll start by saying that. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to say is not going to sound too nice. So I'll start by saying I agree with that. <laughs> okay, that's, that's interesting. I, I think I kind of have the opposite reaction, but go evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that part too, but uh, the rest of the movie, I guess, um, I think my whole thing for the movie, and I guess we can kind of dissect it as we move along, was that I didn't like the character of the Green Hornet. Oh, uh, me either. Oh, I, I, I hated him for most of the movie. Now, I haven't hey. watched... Sorry? I, was about to say, I, I, I guess you're sort of supposed to, it's kind of supposed to be sort of that... Zap Brannigan kiff kind of thing, but I, I he still came across as more repugnant than I guess even he was supposed to be. Mm. I think so. Like I found, even um, as I was leaving, I was thinking this is what would have happened if Batman sucked and was a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's similar stories. He's a rich kid. His parents got killed, but then you know Batman kind of decided to kick ass, and uh, our friend the Green Hornet did not. And, I, I I saw that too, but uh, some of that I I had I had an impression they were they were more trying to emulate kind of the success of Iron Man uh, with yeah. that sort of parody almost of of Tony Stark in the Iron Man movies. I totally got that impression because um, Tony Stark is insufferable as well, but it went almost the opposite direction. He was hard not to enjoy watching. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, uh, he was. He was. <laughs> debonair and competent Brit was just I, I, I don't know if I can say these kind of words on, on this Geek Evolution kind of, <laughs> kind of thing but yeah, he, he, was, he, was negative, he was negative words that I can't say yeah, I, yeah. I, I got what you guys are saying that I, I was kind of frustrated with who he was um, but uh, at the same time I thought it was uh, it was really beneficial because then he got to be uh, um, have this great dynamic with Cato that might not have worked if he were just an all-around good guy, this flawless character. Like, th their banter was because he was kind of a jerk and Kato was kind of his brother, and um, I, I thought it kind of worked for the comedy uh, purposes of the movie that he was this jerk. Uh. I, yeah, I, I did like that. I did like their relationship, and, um, what was I about to say? Oh, yeah, and, and it was, 
you know, there, there were there were parts where I was thinking, you know, if if Cato just left Brit at home, this movie would be over in about ten <laughs> minutes. But but you know, there, there was enough of a justification for him being there since he was, you know, he did provide the raw materials and the money that you know Cato wouldn't be able to do this entirely mm. on his own. Yeah. So it did sort of justify why he was allowed to come along in the first place. <laughs> Actually, that dynamic that we're talking about to me was, I was kind of thinking about this even going into the movie. Most superhero and, um, sorry, sidekick duos, there's always the hero who kicks ass, right? There's Batman, and then there's Robin, who's yeah. dressed up in bright primary colors to draw fire. There's <laughs> Captain America and Bucky. There's Darkwing Duck and Launchpad. And the hero is the one who kicks the crap out of everybody, and, you know, the sidekick gets taken hostage, and it's almost the exact opposite here. Yeah. The guy who's yeah, made hero. I, I did love that dynamic, yeah. I thought that was really interesting, but maybe it just went a little bit too far for me. I was not expecting um, the Green Hornet to be as incompetent as he was. I understand that was really good for the comedic element, which actually really failed on me, but oh. I can see why they did it. You know, although it it did allow for um, Brit to uh, kind of grow throughout the movie, because um, he, he was totally incompetent at the beginning, but by the end, you know, he could uh, hold his own even against Kato when they were kind of... That when they kind of had their falling out, and that I got the feeling by the end of the movie that maybe uh, Cato could teach Brit a thing or two, and he could actually learn it, and vice versa, which was kind of what their whole um, relationship was about. You know, I agree with that for sure. And I have so to I, point I, I, out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say the. I just loved how that Cato uh, Green Hornet fight played out. To me, that was the best part of the movie. <laughs> I just thoroughly enjoyed that. I was waiting for that since about minute number two. <laughs> Actually, I I I, I love I love the concept. I wasn't entirely pleased with the execution. I I was I, I too was waiting for Cato to just go to town on Brit, but I but but it it did it it went on way too long in my opinion. It, to me, it just seemed like well aside aside from Brit fighting dirty, it seemed like Cato would be able to end that fight in about ten seconds. Yes, and it just sure. sort of seemed it just sort of seemed to drag on just so we could have, you know, them breaking more stuff. And 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 then and then when they fell into the pool. I just had images of of that that scene from Dynasty. And uh, it's uh, I don't think that was, was I don't think that was what they were going for. But uh, but yeah, it just seemed like they were just extending it just so we could have you know another fight scene go on. Mm. Yeah, I, I I think that sounds good. I yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah, it did seem a little long. Not that I didn't like it, but it did. Seem <laughs> Did 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 uh, did everybody see it in 3D or was I the only person or did who who, who all saw it in 3D? I saw oh, it. You didn't. It. 2D for me. And Mr. Krellian? Or... Yeah, yeah, I saw it in 3D, and uh, that probably the most pointless 3D I've ever seen. Oh, I, feel. I agree. I I really wish I I could have seen it. Uh, I I didn't want to see it in 3D in the first place, but I, I don't know. Did did you have a hard time? Distinct. I've I've always had a hard time with 3D in general, but I just had a hard time telling what was going on half the time because of it. It was very distracting. Hmm, no, I, I didn't have that problem. Um, I felt like the 3D was kind of flat, but I've also seen a lot of movies in 3D. You know, a couple, Many of my local theaters do 3D, so like the past five movies have probably been in 3D that I've seen. Yeah, but to, to be honest, maybe I'm just losing my mind or something, but I, I had a hard time <laughs> well, we know that's true. R- 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 telling certain actors apart that I, that I, I, I did eventually recognize Tom Wilkinson as, as uh, James Reed, who I thought was awesome. But uh, and this almost sounds terribly racist, and I swear I didn't intend. But I, the entire movie, I thought that Cato was being played by John Cho. You know, the guy who played uh, Sulu in, in, uh, in the new Star Trek movie and, and Harold and Kumar, <laughs> that guy. No, I, 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 did, I did not realize that, that was uh, Jay Chow until until I got on Wikipedia after I got back from the movie. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I don't think you're racist. <laughs> no, I think I think a lot of people probably thought the same thing. And, and also the guy who played uh, Scanlan, for a while I thought that was Fred Willard until I realized I was way too young of a person to be Fred Willard. <laughs> Huh. So I don't know. I, I just had a hard time telling what was going on, and I don't know if that was just the cinematography or just bad 3D conversion. Was it originally shot in 3D? Does anyone know? Because I, I, um, I was about to ask I, that too. I, I don't think so. I mean, it, I, I don't know. But throughout it, I was kind of paying attention to the 3D, and it, it didn't seem like anything was shot with, you know, the three-dimensional depth in mind. I got that impression watching it in 2D. I was looking for elements of 3D, like we, I saw it in um, Despicable Me, Resident Evil, what, 4? There were certain elements that you could tell, yep, this was supposed to be the 3D point. Yeah. 
and uh, I didn't really notice any of that at all. Yeah, there was no close to the camera gun barrels or anything like that. Yeah. Um, although before we leave the 3D thing, I do want to say there was one scene that was really cool in 3D. Um, it's a you know classic sort of movie scene where um, the information is being spread everywhere via the phone and all that, where every time that a new person that finds the information, it cuts off into a different square, and that's its own. Mm -hmm. You remember that scene, right? Yeah. Yeah, in 3D, it was kind of cool, because every one of those panels was at a different depth, so they were really, you know, popping out of the screen, almost like, uh, you know, pictures, uh, photographs cut out and just layered on top of each other, and that actually looked pretty cool, but... Really? I, I, I didn't notice that, that kind of effect uh, in that sequence, so... Oh yeah, it was it was the only time I really noticed anything good about the 3D, but oh wow, but it was noticeable. I, so <laughs> sorry. Something that that I uh, another another sort of liked the concept, but not the execution was was Kato's heightened sense thing. I, oh, I, I got yeah. what they were doing with that, and I liked the idea of it. It was sort of like uh, has anybody seen the 2009 Sherlock Holmes movie? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Just like he fights, you're right. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. It, it it reminded me quite a bit of that, but I thought that Sherlock Holmes did it a lot better. I because I I just the reason is I just didn't like. Uh, it seemed too computerish to me, as if Cato was some sort of robot. I, I wish they'd done in a style that seemed more natural. So it's sort of like uh, Brits, uh, you know, uh, thing where he was you know figuring out the pieces of the puzzle towards the end of the movie. I thought that seemed more in line with the style of this movie than Kato sort of going into infrared targeting things like he's a computer kind of style. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that one, um, actually because I was rewatching some clips online, but um, they, they switch around their special effects all the time because you say, yes. you know, he goes into his slow-mo where he talks to himself and that's very different than Kato's like sort of red vision thing before he fights. But then they have their Matrix elements and slow-mo and um, it wasn't even in the action scene. When was it? Um, like when they were uh, doing the the montage of building the car, yes. and they had all these cool, you know, slow mo effects in there. I felt like it jumped around and just kind of did whatever the heck it wanted to. Um, and I, I thought it was kind of fun. Um, I really enjoyed the special effects during the fight scenes, especially with Kato. Um, the fact that it went kind of computer vision, I thought, oh my god, he's a Terminator. <laughs> this is why he's <laughs> kicking everyone's ass, which I thought was really neat and. I have heard of that kind of thing, this idea of, um, uh, they say, you know, if you're a really good baseball player, you can see the ball being thrown at you, and you can count the stitches on it, and that's how I interpreted Kato was capable of doing, so he was identifying all the threats. The fact that Green Hornet did it near the end, and of course the colors were green, uh, that, that <laughs> was a little bit harder for me to swallow, <laughs> but I did like the Matrix effects that they used as well. I just thought it was kind of neat the way they did it. The only times the effects bothered me is when Kato himself was CG'd for certain um, moves that he performed in the fights. Uh, yeah, I noticed that. And, and it was very obvious, and that to me was a little bit painful. Mm, I, I, I didn't notice that either, but then again, as I was saying, I, I had a hard time <laughs> seeing, a lot, <laughs> seeing, seeing a lot of things in, in that, that movie. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that... Um... He went to CG like when he jumped on the car and off the car onto a guy's yeah. head and stuff like that. Just stuff that they wouldn't have the stuntmen actually do. Um, but you know, all these sort of uh, the the things that would normally bother me about like I don't know clunky CG or or cheesy effects like um, you know like Brit going into slow mo. I, I I don't know. This movie was good at making me just kind of shrug it off because it was so over the top already. All the violence was over the top. And the idea was over the top, so anything goofy, I, I just thought was exactly part of what this movie's about. Um, well, as, as, as long as you mention that, yeah, I, well, I sort of had the opposite feeling. In, in certain ways, I felt that the movie was sort of tonally dissonant sometimes. Mm. Like, I, 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 but uh, I, I agree with you. I loved the parts that were sort of over the top and comedic. I loved the scene with the gas gun, and <laughs> yeah, and, and I. <laughs> And I love the part where, as I said before, where, where Brett is, you know, at the restaurant with Scanlon and then go, goes to his own, you know, putting the pieces together and then it reveals he's been sitting there for five minutes. I love the stuff like that. But I wasn't... I, it, it sort of seemed to just jump from overly cheesy to more serious just on a whim, kind of, and I wasn't sure exactly how I was supposed to... Because, like, you have you have things like he's given... 
a non-lethal gas gun weapon as his thing, but then they're just, you know, mowing down people <laughs> with, you know, with abandon towards the end of the film. And, you know, they even, you know, crush Scanlan under a car at the end of the film. <laughs> I wondered about and, that. But, but at the same alert. time... Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, the big turning point for Brit is when he finds out that you know those seven green clad people have been killed you know by the gangs that's supposed to be a big serious event and mm -hmm. so uh, you know just sort of this, this sort of dissonance between whether killing people is fun and goofy and it's okay or whether killing people is oh this is a terrible you know moral dilemma and it just sort of never it just sort of jumps back and forth on that to me yeah, yeah, I thought about that too, because that, that's a normal sort of superhero thing, to say killing is, is the line, you know, you don't want to kill, you just want to put them in jail, and they sometimes cared about it, they sometimes <laughs> didn't, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of ironic that Cato would give Green Hornet a non-lethal weapon, and then the way he personally butchered a couple of people was almost nightmare-worthy. Yeah. Oh. yeah I, like, I, I, I got woken up the night after by my wife, because it was... The one I, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about with um, oh the main villain I can't remember his name yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was significantly brutal and then I appreciated it um, but maybe not everyone would but I just found it very ironic that oh we have to be careful we're not gonna hurt anybody but now I'm gonna do something incredibly horrible to this main boss <laughs> kind of guy and yeah. oh yeah sure no worries yeah it's good you deserved it yeah the, the over the top violence. Um... With me, like so, somehow I, I kind of like it because it excuses that they don't get bruised and battered in their normal, you know, fights, which is always kind of an issue when you've got fighters on, or you've got superheroes like beating people up and not coming out scratched or anything like that. Um, but I thought that the overtop violence was also like um, it seemed inconsistent with the way that they were promoting this movie. I was thinking it would be like a fun, adventure, like family sort of movie, but I I would walk out if I had a kid with me. Um, For it was, sure. Yeah, kind of disgusting and swearing nonstop. I, uh, I was expecting it to be more of a family movie, but <laughs> I hate to say it, the language didn't even phase me. There was swearing in that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Same, uh, same here. Because well, then again, I didn't see any trailers or anything. I went to this totally cold just because that was what you guys said you wanted to see. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I, I, had, I had no idea what to expect from this at all. But yeah, I, I, I didn't really. I wasn't phased by the by the language, and I. Uh, also, I don't know, I, I guess this is sort of my, my juvenile side, I really like this sort of um, mistaken or unintentional homoerotic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, lines of dialogue between Brit and Cato, that, that always humored me. <laughs> the little subtext there? Yeah, he's like, I, I am not your man, that kind of thing. He's like, oh yeah, he's, he's, he's not my man, he's my, he's ton, that, that kind of stuff, I don't know, I just, that, 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 was, that was some of the only, I wouldn't say it's some of the only, but I, that, that, was, that was humor I did appreciate from from Brett that didn't, you know, annoy me with him. <laughs> it, was just, it was just him tripping over his words. Yeah, have I, either of you two seen other uh, Seth Rogen movies? Because honestly, I haven't, and I don't know if that's just how he is all the time. I've, I've only seen Zack and Miri make a porno. Yeah, I don't think I've seen anything with him, but I've, I've seen I, plenty of modern comedies, so... I get the impression that this was just Seth Rogen as Seth Rogen with the backdrop being Green Hornet, and maybe that was the whole thing for me. Me, uh, me too. I, I, I do feel, based on what little I know of Green Hornet and what little I learned from Green Hornet since I watched the movie, that, that the character was rewritten to be Seth Rogen dressed up as Green Hornet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess that's the same thing with like my thinking it was supposed to be family-friendly and it wasn't. Um, it, this felt a lot more like a comedy with superhero elements than a superhero movie with comedy elements. Yes, I totally agree with that. How did you guys feel about about Chudnovsky, uh, the villain? Um, <laughs> honestly, I I thought he was kind of uninspired. I I think maybe the whole tone for the movie to me came about when he pulled out his double-barreled handgun, and I just thought, why? Now he demonstrated why, and I think it was for a gag right at the very end, the reason he had it. But it was just kind of one of those things. If it was just Cato, he would have just beat the hell out of him in 10 minutes and it would have been over <laughs> he just didn't seem threat like to me i don't know well see i i actually i love that opening scene with him and, and james franco is uh crystal clear i, I thought oh, that yeah. that that immediately well at least in my mind what i thought it, was that it set 
the stage for the tone of the movie and who this villain was supposed to be. But but then towards the end, it sort of seemed to lose focus of that. I, I liked him being being sort of cowed by James Franco, but then yes. you know showing that he had his own sort of you know gimmick. And, and I and like I like the fact of him being sort of self conscious about his image. And and and, and, and one, one of my favorite lines was was when he kills that meth dealer after he you know after, after the green hornet drives his car through his house and blows up his lab. And, and then he says something to the effect of uh, see this this guy comes into a you know this guy in a mask comes in and not because of him this man is dead. I thought that was really hilarious. Yeah. But, I- but I, 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 towards the end, when he um, when he changes the blood Nazi, I, I I thought that that could have been a good sort of you know character thing for him, where he gets so sort of paranoid that he feels compelled to do this. But again, it's sort of it was good in concept, but not an execution, because in the final the, the final uh, battle, he was just so over the top, so silly that I couldn't take him remotely seriously anymore. Uh, I so it just help. didn't work. You see, but that was, uh, I, I kind of like that because I thought that was the point of who he was that, um, you know, you know, the young guy, James Franco. And by the way, I liked seeing him in there. I always like little cameos like that or whatever. Yes. But, um, <laughs> they, you know, he was, he was telling him to his face, um, you're doing this all wrong. You're, you're not acting like a proper villain should. Um, and the guy had to prove it to him with violence that he can still, you know, get the results um and then as an audience member i felt the whole time too just exactly what you guys are talking about that he he felt kind of weird he wasn't you know all that scary even though he wanted to be and the the ending was kind of strange but i I don't know i thought that was the point because because he's this this washed up has been of a villain and um i I don't know I, i i liked him a lot um Similar to that point, I'm wondering if the reason that maybe he wasn't as threat-worthy as you might be used to in a comic book movie is because Green Hornet couldn't have dealt with something more threat-worthy. Like, um, <laughs> oh, but cool. you know what I mean? Like, I he, he seemed tame, and maybe that's because Green Hornet, in that respect, is tame. It, it's not kind of like Batman taking on the Joker, who's you know the epic mastermind genius. This guy is, you know, not much more than a low-level mob guy, and. To make him more of a serious threat, it probably would not play well against the Green Hornet, who would not be capable of dealing with that. It's kind of like his starter villain to beat the tar out of. And I'm wondering if that's kind of was the point of the whole thing. They can't have a super Galactus kind of threat because the Green Hornet just probably couldn't deal with it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with that. And, and, and as I said, it worked for me right up until the very end. I thought he was a perfect villain for, for this character and for this movie. Up until the end, where I thought they took it a little bit too far in, the, in, in that direction. Huh. Um, but um, I, um, th- this is something that, that, that bugged me not not more than anything else, because I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to the thing that bugged me the most in a minute. But something that bugged me, I, I, liked, I loved their first mission. Where yeah, you know, they, they where, he, where he sort of falls into crime fighting when they're you know cutting off his you know the head of his father's statue, <laughs> and, and and that that whole sequence was great. And you show off what Kano gets to do and all that kind of stuff. But what I what I the scene should have ended right there. They had a car chase right after that. They came out of nowhere, didn't do anything. It I, I just I hated that point because because this. This movie, as you know, has no shortage of car chases in it, <laughs> and, 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 this, and this one just seemed one. like it didn't serve any kind of purpose. Were they in the um, the the main Green Hornet car at that point? I can't remember. No, I it, it was just it, yeah, it, it wasn't Black Beauty yet. It was just the car that his father had had commissioned that had the the, the okay. Ben Hur wheels as, as yeah. Vehicle. I mean, I think wasn't it was just the same one? That. The the pre Black Beauty, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. The proto Black Beauty. Well, see, what annoyed me about that is that the 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 news coverage the next day, all they do is talk about somebody vandalized the statue, whereas I would think it would would have been much more newsworthy that hey, somebody plowed a cop car through a storefront window. Nobody mentioned that. You could have taken that scene <laughs> out of the movie, and you never would have noticed it was gone. That's very true. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
uh, if you guys don't mind moving on to a, a different thing, um, I want to know what you guys think about the dad, because I have some, or I guess uh, Britt's relationship with his father, because, I don't know, I've got some opinions about that one. <laughs> I, I I liked I liked the uh, I don't know if I like the character I, I like the concept of the character because um, just how we're supposed to feel about him I thought was one of the, the good things about the movie because you know when, when you see him when Brit's a kid you know you really don't like him but then when you see it, see him when Brit's an adult all of you know his sort of bad qualities seem to be justified because you know. It is being a completely worthless waste of space, and his father is, you know, right for being so hard on him. Uh, but and I, I like the fact that um, it, it might almost be sort of a an unreliable narrator kind of thing because you know we we see him through Britain and Kato, and, and even Kato being as as amazing as he is is still. You know, as we see with his resume writing later on, that he doesn't really have any kind of, you know, real marketable skills. So, they're, so in a way, they're both kind of slackers. So I, I can see why we as the audience are seeing uh, James read through their eyes and he's coming across as, you know, this unlikable person, even though he's really, you know, in a way sort of the most upstanding, mis- upstanding member of society as we later find out. Huh. Because um, I. I actually kind of had the opposite reaction to the dad. Like, I know the movie was trying to paint him as as a good guy by the end. You know, he was saying like, "Oh, let's do this for dad," and um, you know that. Uh, um, let's see. Oh, and that they like glued the head back on and stuff. You know, symbolically showing. Oh no, that the dad's uh, reputation has been restored um, in the eyes of Brit or whatever. Um, but but I, I kind of after the movie was thinking about it. I'm like, this dad's still not that good of a guy. I mean. A jerk father is a jerk father. No oh yeah, he's he's he's, he's still kind of. definitely a jerk. I, I won't I won't I won't debate you on that one. He definitely yeah. is. And and even the, even the idea of like uh, that he um, would stand up to um, what was the politician's name? Scan Scanlon. Scanlon. Yeah. Even even the idea that he would stand up to that guy and that's what got him killed. It was like uh, he stood up to that guy after years of giving in and printing lies and all that. Um, where Brit um, was, I, I don't know, a much better man than his father, that as soon as Scanlan, uh, you know, proposed anything shady to him, uh, he stood his ground right then and did something about it, and um, where but, the dad uh, was weak did, in that did, regard. Didn't James only give in only after uh, his, one of his reporters got killed trying to uncover that stuff? Is that how it went down? Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. but uh, I, I don't know. He's still, even trying to protect people... Um, he, he should just get out of the business altogether, then do what the bad guys want. Um, like, he got halfway to a good deed, but not quite all the way. At least that's what I think. Yeah. It, I agree. It was kind of a last second, oh, by the way, your dad was a dick, but he was still eventually tried to do the right thing. It it, it yeah. seemed like they were almost r- wrote themselves into a corner. And it says, oh, by the way, he turned out to be a good guy in the end, or at least... Um, I don't want to say honorable, but he, you know, eventually decided to do the right thing. Um, it, it seemed a little, I don't know, half baked to me. Trite. It just, uh, mm. it was not convincing. I guess that. Oh, by the way, my father actually was a good man. Oh, you know, eh, it didn't work for me very well. Uh, I guess I'm in the minority on this one. Uh, I want to know if we can move on to something that uh, may be totally forgettable, but. Cameron Diaz was apparently in that movie. Oh, was, was she really? I forgot about that. <laughs> I, I had to look up her name because I, I couldn't remember what the character's name was. I'm just like, Cameron Diaz, whoever she was, the, the girl. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't figure out why. Like, Even walking out of that movie, I was thinking, why she was she in this? The, the, the little brief conflict between the two protagonists and mm-hmm. she has but, nice legs. That's really was about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I... Yeah, I have this whole page of notes typed up, and she isn't mentioned in any of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you know, she was in there, I guess, for Cato and Brit to fight over and se- and you know have this separation between them. But they were already fighting over the limelight, so I'd, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, like... I I did sort of. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I, I do agree. I, I didn't like that she was sort of there as the love triangle thing, but I, I guess I, I do sort of see her existence as being justified. 
uh, you know, in, in the fact that she has this knowledge of, of crime more than either either one of them would. Yeah. So so I do sort of like that, that angle that they're sort of, you know, figuring out what to do by what she thinks they're going to do. Yeah, I, 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 I guess she was appreciate that angle. angle. Oh, yeah, I guess she was an actual character in uh, the, the Green Horn lore or whatever. Um, so they had to include her for that reason, I guess. <laughs> oh, see, I didn't even know that either. That would make sense. We wouldn't want to get the fanboys angry. Um, yeah, but the, the love triangle I thought was kind of dumb. Especially because it didn't resolve with either one of them getting the girl. Like, it just Very true. Out. <laughs> it seemed like I was, I was, I was okay with that. I was okay with nobody getting a girl, actually. It's just that's because you know it's, 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 that's so expected to, to have that happen. It's it's nice that she sort of refused to fall into that role. I guess. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I I guess we're almost right out of time, but I, I I did want to talk about the the climax of the film, the giant car chase, newspaper building shootout thing. How did, how did everybody feel about that? Some of the action sequences I thought were really good. Um, some of the popcorn logic started to bother me a little bit at that point. Um, but all in all, I thought it was it was it was pretty good for what I expected it to be. Um, again, the graphic violence at the end I approve of. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I thought I thought the the climax was pretty good. It's right up until the very end with the ejector seats. I, I couldn't deal with that. The car took such a beating though. They shouldn't do bad things like that. Cars like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. The the whole climax. Uh, I I liked all the action. I mean, just throughout this movie, I liked the action. I thought it was fun, and I thought they had a. Uh, enough stuff going on that there was sort of like a plot to the action where normally I'm the guy that falls asleep during the action sequence of movies um, that just kind of drones on but for some reason this one um, I was able to uh, really get tuned into it um, but I kind of felt like the the reason for the climax that they wanted to put this thing online at their uh, their newspaper headquarters I, I thought that was kind of forced um, that nowadays everything's wireless and cell phone I mean it, I, I don't know, it seemed like there wasn't a good enough reason for them to storm the building um, when they could have done a number of other simpler um, solutions to this whole problem. But, but I, I, I agree, concept. that really... That, 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 I, I found myself thinking the entire time, so what's going to happen if Brit succeeds in getting this thing out? I mean, it's not like the bad guys are just going to go, oh, well, we failed, we should go away now. They're, you know, they're still yeah. going to be after them and trying to... I mean, so they, so they, they sort of you know, from a tactical standpoint, it, you know, they've sort of driven themselves into this corner here. Now they're in this building, and there's, you know, they're going to have people trying to kill them no matter what they do. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the final task was overhyped. I, I would just kind of describe mm -hmm. it as that. It, it was like, yep, we got to get this online, and, like, there's no Starbucks nearby. You, you couldn't... Yeah. It just um, I did like the fact that it did end up in the newspaper just because I just thought seeing all the newspaper machinery was very cool. Um, but it seemed that point seemed kind of contrived just to get back to kind of where I guess the epicenter of what the Green Hornet is because he's fueled by the media at yeah, that point true. anyway. So but still, I mean, d d didn't didn't end up being completely pointless anyway? Didn't he fail? He yeah. didn't <laughs> manage to record. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, that was funny, but at the same time, it's like what what was the point of this twenty minute action sequence if we didn't accomplish anything? They were just being I mean, around. They, they 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 killed Scandra, they killed uh, Bloodnovsky, but they didn't manage to expose any of the the truths behind what was going on. I'm wondering if that was almost still kind of the point though, because again, the Green Hornet's new to this and he's kind of a bumbling idiot. So it almost makes sense that he gets to that critical moment, everything's on the line, he's going to upload this data and, and change everything, and then boom, oh, you forgot to hit record, you know? Um, it, it's almost, to me, seemed like it was anticlimactic on purpose. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I can agree with that. I just, I, I just wish they could have found some other way to make up for it, as in, you know... Maybe engineer a second confession just to you know just for comedy's sake. Even yeah, you know, even even if only even if only for that, because it just yeah. You know, or, or if he had to come, it's sort of sort of like how they 
dealt with his fighting skill to the end where he just you know does go into his his own sort of slow motion kind of thing if they sort of done that with with the uh, with with the confession, if he, he, if he had to sort of come up with a new a new plan to get that confession out the last second, right, rather yeah. than just running him off a building. Yeah, now you can't forget though too, like the whole point of uh, Green Hornet, his self proclaimed idea is that they'll play the bad guy, um, and they'll just take care of the um, the, the the scum of the city uh, behind the scenes, and that is kind of how it got resolved that they didn't expose the truth. Um, but they did take care of the bad guy, and that's all he ever wanted in the first place. But if that's all he ever wanted, then why go to the newspaper in the first place to try to upload the confession? Yeah, that's true. Get yeah. A little out of role for his normal Green Hornet um, character. But, the, uh, the, the, the one part during that where my jaw just dropped was when the half of the Black Beauty rode up the elevator and opened on the 10th floor, and that was the moment where all the employees realized something was going on. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't hear all the things smashing through windows, all the machine gun fire below, uh, the, the car smashing the glass outside of the elevator up to that point. It was only when the elevator door opened that they even know that that, 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 that that's just when my suspension of disbelief kind of went out the window. <laughs> and didn't oh, that, that whole scene movie. take place at night? Like, I, I understand probably newspapers are, you know, kind of a 24-hour operation, but they wouldn't have, the, like, the full staff there either, you wouldn't yeah. think. Yeah, it was the middle of the night. It, mm-hmm. it, I, I didn't really think of it um, having nobody, or didn't think of it as an issue that there was nobody there. But I, I love just that think the there were many. <laughs> Sorry. Just as a as a as a very minor tiny thing, I I, I liked the idea of them putting a, a Green Hornet email address on their business cards. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. That 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 was very enjoyable. <laughs> and and, and it worked in the plot too. So you know, that's a win win for me there. Um, one thing, while we're still talking about uh, that whole climax, um, I loved, I, I know you said uh, Evil Professor is something that you, you didn't like about the ejector seat and the car getting torn to shreds, and oh man, I hate to see that car get broken too. Um, but I was kind of like, thank God, that at first I thought they were indestructible, and then by the, the entire span of the climax, whatever that was, half an hour, um, I thought they were dead. I mean, the, the car had been destroyed and totaled <laughs> and literally cut in half and on the, you know, a high story of a skyscraper and they can't drive down that thing. And, um, I, I don't know, it, it, it did good for me because me I too. believe that they could die any second here. <laughs> mm-hmm. And in fact, he did get shot. So uh, spoiler there too. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Only a couple more people will probably see it. <laughs> and, uh, let's see, uh, since we're running out of time, um, do you guys want to talk about any last thing, maybe the, the very ending, the press conference, um, or any additional thoughts before we turn this thing off? I did enjoy the, the press conference. Um, it was a nice way of explaining the gunshot wound, especially when they discovered that um, Cameron Diaz's character couldn't dig it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just in terms of, I guess, final thoughts, I love the Bruce Lee references they had. I was, yes, TV. yes, I love that too. <laughs> they couldn't call him to do the part, obviously. Um, so I thought that was excellent, the, the, the sketches and that little um, short punch attack that he does at one point. Oh, yeah. um, final thoughts. Um, I honestly would have walked out if we weren't doing this tonight. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'll, um, well, I, I guess first, first with the press conference, I'll say that uh, I... Again, it's again for me. It's concept versus execution. I liked the idea, but it just seemed too rushed. Like, oh, right at time. Here's a press conference, and this ties everything up nicely in the end. And so it just seemed like it just sort of it happened, and then the movie ended, and ended, and that was it. But um, as far as final thoughts go, uh, this is something I, I didn't even realize till after I, you know, looked up information on the movie. Is that this was directed by Michelle Gondry, who uh, did Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is one of my favorite movies. And uh, I, based on that information, I was a little, I was even slightly more disappointed than I was when I left the theater because it was sort of a, a letdown. Because I think he sort of tried to bring in that same kind of visual flair and tonal dissonance that he used in Eternal Sunshine, but it worked better in that movie than it does in this one. And 
and finally, um, I'm, I'm one of those people who doesn't usually like to hear when people say, oh, well, this first movie wasn't so bad, but I think they'll really do a lot better in a sequel. Because, <laughs> yeah, because, because I'm always of the mind that you have to earn your sequel, and if you don't make a good first movie, then I don't want to see any more of you. But in this case, I can almost see myself enjoying those two characters, uh, Brit and Kato, together just with a better, better more focused script. Because I, I liked them together, I just wasn't entirely sure about some of the things that happened. So, overall, I, I enjoyed the parts that were, they were supposed to be funny, but a lot of it just sort of, it didn't gel. And yeah. That's my thought. Yeah. Um, for, for that ending sequence, I, I, I swear, I, I thought during the press conference, I thought he was going to pull a Tony Stark and say that he's going to horn it. Especially for the whole time, he was so obsessed with being this cool superhero guy. But, but I, I thought it was clever how they did it anyways. Um, but overall, um, I, I really loved this movie. Uh, and I heard, you know, all my friends say good things about it. And, like, adults that never go to movies, like my friend's parents that you know hate funny movies that they said that they love this movie so i had really high expectations for it and i thought that was going to make me you know dislike it because the higher your expectations you know the lower the results usually um but i loved this movie like i caught myself you know like smiling and telling myself okay stop smiling you're in a movie you're not like being <laughs> camera uh photographed or anything like that um, but I thought I thought the action was a lot of fun, and I thought it was really funny. Maybe it's because I love comedies um, that this movie really um, hit me in the right way. Um, and yeah, I, I I had some problems. I didn't really care for Cameron Diaz's character and why she was in there. The the, the action went on a little long, um, but I, I I just thought it was a really good job of making a fun movie. It felt like a summer blockbuster, but it was in the middle of January. <laughs> So I guess overall, uh, Mr. Krellian loved it. I was sort of lukewarm about it, and uh, evil, evil Professor would have walked out on it. So, yep. Yep. so I guess we covered the gamut on, on opinions there. <laughs> so do we vote for Top Banana and vote somebody off now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got Green Hornet for Top Banana. <laughs> uh, Kato for Top Banana? Yeah, Kato for Top Banana. Oh, definitely. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no matter what you think is uh, wrong with the movie, you've got to love Kato, right? Oh, Kato was so awesome. <laughs> yes. I have to agree with that. Okay, well, uh, we've uh, gone a little bit over half an hour now, so I guess this is it. <laughs> All right, so yay, Geek Evolution, uh, oh. and who reviews the reviewers? Yeah. Brown Code Eric, Real Minutes. This, was, uh, this and... was fun doing with you guys. It was a great time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I I'm Mr. Corellian. I am Mr. Fusion. And I am the evil professor. <laughs> See ya. That was nice. Thank you. It's my cool radio voice. <laughs>